Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm, I'm well. Great. Um, we're fortunate this morning to sit down with former Representative Peter C. Wambach, Jr., uh, who represented the 103rd District, uh, which include parts of Dauphin County, including the city of Harrisburg, Steelton Borough, and parts of Swatara Township, uh, having served from 1980 to 1992. Sir, thank you for sitting down with us this morning. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, I always l like mentioning those areas outside the city, and I'm glad you did, because uh, it was the fourth ward of Steelton which got me down into a great area for, uh, for ethnicity, and also the triple cities of Oberlin and Houghton Bressler, and that's what they referred themselves as, and I was delighted to represent that area outside the city as well as the entire city of Harrisburg. Great. Well, before we even get into all of your illustrious legislative career, you served here a number of years. Um, I want to first talk, touch on uh, something I know that's very important to you, and that's your family and your upbringing. Uh, I want you to discuss a little bit of that, but also tie it into how that sort of uh, steered you toward a, a life in public service. Well, actually, my interest in serving um, really went back to a fourth grade trip that we made, a day trip, if you will, uh, connected to our civics class. And it came down to the Capitol, and we, we, uh, we came down from St. Margaret Mary School in Pembroke and uh, walked into the Capitol building. And just the first view of the rotunda was just, uh, I was in awe of the building to begin with. And then. Beyond that, sitting in the gallery at the House of Representatives when the tour guides came up and gave you a little history of what was, would go on during a session day in the House of Representatives, I just thought, you know, one day maybe I'd like to be a member of this. I like representative democracy, and this is what we learned in civics class, and that's why we were here. And uh, sure enough, you know, in 80, when I took that oath of office, I, my memory went all the way back to that fourth grade. Uh, class trip, if you will, to the Capitol building to say that uh, it was basically a culmination of a dream come true um, and the responsibility that comes with that, you know, uh, being honored by the, uh, by the citizens of the 103rd District to represent you as their representative right. to elect you and, um, <clears throat> and to put their faith and trust in one single person to take their views to the one of the, uh, you know, classic uh, uh, bodies of legislative government in Pennsylvania was just uh, uh, a dream beyond compare. And, uh, and to work that day in and day out, I never forgot who my bosses were. And they were the mm -hmm. almost 60,000 people I represented. Right. Because when they would call, they would say things to put me on the pedestal, and I would automatically turn it around and say, look, you're my boss. Uh, it's not the other way around. I, I'm not the boss of you. I represent you and your voices in the in the House of Representatives. That's why, to me, it was also an indicative of going around and getting involved in community groups and things of that sort. We had over 30 of them in the city of Harrisburg back in those days, and you can imagine what my schedule was uh, mm -hmm. at nighttime, let alone during the day, because people wanted you to speak at their little luncheon events and stuff like that at the senior center, Absolutely. besides the fact of being out at night to community group meetings and everything else. And I think the one great accolade I got after running for a number of terms, uh, I got a question one time at a candidate's uh, forum that said, how come we only see you at election time? And the whole audience was almost said in unison, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> and it was really an affirmation of, uh, of, of my work and being in the community and understanding that this wasn't a job where my views were representative on the floor of the House. They were the views of my constituency, all 60,000 of them. Well, the Wambach name is, is uh, known throughout Pennsylvania, and even more so in the city of Harrisburg. Um, what was it uh, like growing up uh, with that last name, with your father being a, a positive personality throughout the state? How did that aid you um, growing up and then running for office? Well, you know, uh, Dad always said that um, the, uh, uh, if you want to stay in Harrisburg, you got to get to know what the, big, the biggest business was in Harrisburg. And the biggest business in Harrisburg is the capital, mm -hmm. right. is government. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, I think he always geared a lot of his children, and I were, there were 14 of us, okay, uh, towards that building downtown with the dome on it. You know, get to know what it means for the government to be involved in your lives, and get to know what it means for you to be involved in government. And as a result of that, you know, we always, uh, there were a number of us that always had that in the back of our minds to what it would be to serve. 
uh, and serve on, in any capacity as long as you were serving, you know, the people of the area, whether or not it was on the neighborhood basis, helping senior citizens that are next door to you or are serving at, in city government, which my brother Paul had a 20-year career as city treasurer in Harrisburg, or in state government level, which I had and was happy to have a a 35 and a half year career in state government, uh -huh. but 12 of those years were spent in elective government, which was the House of Representatives. So he always had that uh, instilled in us. Uh, there were some that followed that pathway, obviously, and there's some that weren't, but uh, government was a really a major, major uh, uh, aspect of our early lives. You know, my father was a speechwriter for Governor Leader and Governor Lawrence. So as a young man at the age of, you know, Ten years old. I mean, uh, you know, going out and spending an afternoon at the governor's residence, which was out at Indian Town Gap, you know, with the number one official in the state, you know, and his wife and his family, you know, was a, a really unique experience. Uh, so the involvement was when, for instance, when Jack Kennedy was running for for uh, presidency in the six in '60. Uh, I had an opportunity to shake his hand on Market Square, you know, uh, I mean, to be involved in that that kind of thing. Uh, it was because I wanted to be, and that's why going back to that fourth grade trip was so important, uh, to be in the seat of government and then to know at an early age, believe me, uh, that uh, civics and representation was what I wanted to do uh, eventually, you know, when I, if I ha ever had the opportunity, and thank God I did. And before you got there, uh, you had opportunity to go to school, uh, to go to college, and you have a great story about that. I want you to describe yeah, that, that process. Yeah, that was interesting. Uh, in my junior year of high school, I got a job as a page boy in the House of Representatives. So in 1962-63, I had my first job after school to come down and be a page boy in the House of Representatives, which was fantastic, you know. And sitting there, and then probably early in 63 going to your parents and saying, now look, I'll be graduating from high school, uh, you know, in 64, and maybe we should be considering where I'm going to go. And my father, I never saw him with a tear in his eye, except, you know, if it was a death of a friend or an illness or something like that. Uh, he was an emotional guy, but never, you know, to the point of tears. And he had this tear in his eye, and, and he says, you know, your mom and I, we just don't have any more money for tuition. Uh, payments because there's five of your brothers and sisters already in school and I was really disillusioned I mean I, I I didn't like the response because I was an honor student in high school and and obviously I wanted to per, uh, c pursue a career at college at the college level and I did remember some discussions because I always kept my ears open and my mouth shut when I was a little page boy back in those days but you became friends with a few members and, and those kinds of things. And I, I still remember uh, people like Jack Gailey from York and, and Jeanette Reedman, who ended up having a wonderful career in the House and then moving on to the Senate, mm -hmm. becoming educational chair in the Senate, discussing this community college concept back in 1963. And, and it was introduced, and I kept watching this House Bill 1066, and I did my own little lobbying back those, those days, saying how important it would be for me to have this thing established. Little did I know, it was more or less, if you call it, greased uh, to pass, because it was introduced in May and signed, uh, uh, well, passed the House uh, later on that month, and then in July it passed the Senate. So, you know, a major piece of legislation like right. that, as you know, that doesn't uh, go through very quickly unless everybody was on board, and everybody was on board to establish the community college system. But I, it meant so much to me that when Act 484, and that's what it became known as, the Community College Act of 1963 was signed into law in the governor's reception room by Governor Bill Scranton, I was there. I was there because this was my pathway. And as a result of that, you know, I graduated from high school in, in May of uh, 1964 and entered Hack in September of 1964. Wow. Hack was the first community college created under the Act, and, and obviously uh, walking in and taking my first class in the first community college established uh, was just an incredible thing to know that things can happen uh, when people are totally on board and interested in 
and what's going on. And the issue was that important to, can you imagine the hundreds of thousands of people that that bill has affected Absolutely. since yeah. 1964? I mean, it's amazing, uh, the 14 community college just, uh, colleges that we have today. And then now, being on the board of trustees at HAC, it's almost like a payback, right. if you will, to uh, because without that and without subsequently going on to Penn State Harrisburg, uh, where I got my my uh, final uh, BS degree, that uh, you know, if it wasn't for Hack, I don't know what I would have done because even though student loans were available, hey, I was a 17-year-old kid that never made a loan in my life. You know, I mean, I, I didn't know how to go about that and what to do and all of that, and and to hear that kind of comment from my dad that he was tapped out with five kids already in school, but have the response that came as a result of a good effort and a need in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. to establish this kind of a community college system that were being created all across the country at that, in those years mm -hmm. was uh, an important aspect uh, for me to, to find a career and to move on through, through education that was afforded me and affordable um, as our mission today. It's still providing an affordable means of an education for those first two years of college for Absolutely. anybody that wanted to pursue it. So that was, um, that, that was a real important piece of legislation in my life, something I, I cannot forget, the impact that it had on me. What influences then uh, sort of steered you toward registering as a Democrat? I mean, the, the, what it means to be a Democrat has changed over the years, uh, uh, phasing well, with the different things that happened throughout the nation. What, what being a political there? scientist, you know, uh, if you will, my degree was in political science, probably they said back in those days 80 percent of the reason why people join a certain party is because of custom and tradition. So my parents were customarily and traditionally uh, Democrats. So, uh, and working in the trenches, I know with Dad, you know, working with Governor Leader and Lawrence, who were, who were Democratic governors in the 50s and in the, in the 60s. Uh, Governor Milton Schaap, my father was his campaign director in half of the state uh, when he was running. Uh, you know, uh, we kind of grew up in the Democratic Party and the Democratic traditions. I, I kind of like the fact that uh, uh, the Democratic traditions speak to basic needs, uh, if you will, if you want to encapsulate it into one, one little phrase, that would probably be it. And, uh, and uh, I grew up uh, in that tradition. So you had this determination or this foresight that, yes, you wanted to run as a public official. Why then? at 79, 80, why was that the perfect time for you to run for a state representative? Well, what happened then was um, uh, Steve Reed, who ended up as being the um, uh, mayor of the city of Harrisburg mm -hmm. for almost 30 years, but prior to that, he decided to run for county commissioner. And I, at the time, was working uh, as the regional director for the Bureau of the Census uh, on a federal basis. Uh, I was in charge of the census in Dauphin, um, York, and Schuylkill counties in Pennsylvania. And what happened was, um, I was I was hatched. It's the, it's the Hatch Act on the federal right. level. It's called mm -hmm. where you can't run for political office and still maintain the job. And when uh, at the time when State Representative Steve Reed decided to run for for county commissioner. It was my uh, thought that what he would do if he was elected, that he would uh, take that position and give up his House seat in creating an open seat in which the leadership then or the speaker would then set a date for an election. So I would only be out of work maybe you know, about three to four months at, at, the, at the longest right. where I could leave my job and declare my candidacy, run, and get elected. Uh, but what happened was Steve decided to keep both positions. He kept his state representative job, and he and he kept uh, his his um, county commissioner's job. Obviously, just being elected to it. However, I, it was my understanding it was the advice of the leadership in the house that he would stay in the, in the house because uh, there was always a possibility of not winning a seat, sure. and right. they didn't want to lose a seat then too. So it wasn't strictly regarding what, mm -hmm. what Steve decided to do, I think the influence of the leadership he decided to go along with. Well, that created a longer period of time that I was out of work. 
I, I ended up getting a part-time job working for a contractor. I, I ended up cutting this thumb off. Uh, oh. As a result, I don't have this top digit to bend anymore, and I don't have any feeling in it. But I was running a circuit or a saw, something I shouldn't have been doing. But, uh, but as a result, I, I mean, I, I, I ended up actually going door to door with this all wrapped up and I used that entire season after what would have been an elected pri uh, primary where I would have been elected in a primary and then running again for office in the general election if I would have won that primary as well but but the I thought the race would have been decided then you know mm -hmm. to fill the seat and then then to run for a two-year term during that cycle as well it didn't happen that way but it, it afforded me the opportunity to stay knocking on doors and I have to say that I'm very proud of the fact that first year uh, when I ran I had 87 percent of the doors personally wow. talking to 87 percent of the people belly to belly eye to eye right. and I think as a result of that that, that really uh, propelled me into that first victory uh, which I was uh, like I said delighted to serve and I was obviously happy to have you know six terms in the House of Representatives, mm -hmm. but uh, that uh, and and again the the all that you get by by serving, uh, being that elected person for the people that you were elected to serve is just a feeling that you can never ever replace. It's just an amazing feeling. Well, that's a good segue then to talk a little bit about your district. You mentioned the areas that were encompassed in there, but what type of uh, demographics or, or voting ratio, or the types of things that make your district unique? Well, the city of Harrisburg, uh, actually, uh, when I first ran in 1980, it didn't include the, the, the areas outside of the city that you mentioned at the top end, and it didn't include uh, the uh, 13th Ward, uh, 14th and 15th Ward in the city. So it was only the first uh, 12 wards in the city that I represented, which wasn't the entire city, but over that 10-year period from 1970 to 1980, and as you know, the districts are based on the census numbers, right. Harrisburg had lost population, so the district had to be expanded, if you will, to create an even number of districts under one man, one vote doctrine. Okay. So as a result uh, of, of that, uh, in running that year, uh, Harrisburg was considered a swing, this district was considered a swing district. Uh, uh, a Republican could, could win just as easily as a Democrat. Uh, the numbers were that close. Uh, there was nothing really that uh, would would indicate this is an automatic seat. As it is almost today, it's a Democratic seat today because of the hard work of the party um, in the city and in, in the outside environs. But, uh, but the important thing was, back in those days, if you wanted that seat, you worked hard for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Although I said uh, working and hitting 87 percent of the doors, I won the election by 1,100 votes. I mean, that's how yeah. that's how close it was. So, uh, as a result of all of that, you know, um, the, the Democrat uh, the, the Democratic Party started to grow in the 103rd district, uh, having a mayor that uh, that was Democrat right. in the form of Steve Reed, mm -hmm. having a um, having also a state representative that was uh, a Democrat as well. We worked very well together on issues that were common uh, in the needs for the city and, uh, and the speciality of what the city is as the capital I think is important as well to, uh, uh, to stress. You know, I always felt that it had an, uh, had an important part of Pennsylvania by being the capital city. And Steve Reed did, did as well. And, uh, but it was, um, it was a district that, uh, that demanded attention uh, you couldn't turn your back on it ever. You right. know, you had to. Uh, the community groups were growing. There were 30 of them, uh, like I said, uh, across the district that uh, that demanded uh, you to be there at their meetings and uh, and to take their concerns back to the f state government if uh, something was needed uh, on a road that may have been controlled by the state that was running through their neighborhoods or whatever. So uh, to stay in touch w was in, was important. And being the local representative you could never get away from your district. Absolutely. I mean, whether you were out at a grocery store or getting a tire changed or something like that at a gas station, you always had that piece of paper in your pocket that you pulled out and made notes because someone invariably would come up to you and say, hey, look, we're having a problem over here and there and whatever. And even when I gave up the seat in 1992, I decided not to seek re-election. And, uh, and for maybe the first six or eight months of, of Ron Buxton's term, who took over from me, succeeded me, 
uh, I was still taking notes and calling his office. He with, and then came finally, to you. <laughs> I, I said, you know, I gave him Ron's number and said, call him directly. He'll be very happy to take care of your needs, right. you know. But uh, uh, it was hard to, to um, not necessarily break away because I made that decision to break away from the standpoint of representative. But it was hard to not to take people's concerns and move them forward through the elected representative. And I made sure that his office got a hold of those requests. But finally, it was a direct kind of referral to his office rather than through me. What types of specific things? You said people come up to you all the time, no matter where you are. What types of things would they ask for? What type of constituent service would you provide to your uh, There was uh, a situation, uh, for instance, uh, street lights that are out common today as well. You know, what, uh, what can the state do to, to, to turn them back on, if you will? And in, in reality, what it was is you were acting as a conduit to, to, f to get their request to the right place. And as a result, uh, you know, you would call, uh, you know, the city highway department and say, hey, look, there's some lights out over on Radnor Street. Could you turn them back on or get more bulbs over there and whatever? Uh, those kinds of things. As far as the state level was concerned, there were a lot of requests for, as, uh, as a poor district is, for uh, public assistance uh, and uh, everything that uh, evolves around the system of helping people uh, so they don't fall through the safety net. Uh, uh, a tremendous amount of inquiries that way. And, uh, but obviously, uh, you know, those kinds of things, uh, snow removal. I had a situation where uh, I still remember their names, God bless them, the, the Bibby, uh, Bibby sisters that lived on the corner of, of Foster Street and Green Street on a house that their side of their house was on Foster Street. Hmm. And Foster Street was under the domain of of the state and uh, you know they would take their plows and run them across the Harvey Taylor Bridge and turn around and come back again and clean that area and the poor Bippy s sisters they had just paid some young man to go and uh, shovel their snow you know and uh, and they had a nice clean sidewalk there you know and no more than probably a half hour later, the PennDOT trucks came down and threw everything back, ice and <laughs> back into the sidewalk. And, you know, they didn't have another $7 to pay some kid to do it again. And they called my office and said, is there anything you can do to, well, what am I going to do? Call PennDOT and say to do it? So uh, <laughs> what I did was I, I only had one more appointment that day, and I took the appointment. And afterwards, I went home and changed clothes and went out there and shoveled the bippy snow, you know. and. And uh, they yelled out their window, you know, thank you so much, sir. And I said, oh, you're welcome, Mrs. Bippy, you know, Miss Bippy, uh, you know. And, and they looked at me and said, oh, we're well, representing well, We didn't want you to do it. Well, I said, I'm happy to do it for you, you know. But it, in a way, you know, everybody was operating on, on a paycheck to paycheck kind of situation, whatever. And uh, it just took more time out of my day, but I, it, was hap it happened that I had the time to do it, and I did it. I mean, uh, I don't suggest that every state representative do that, you know, but I felt the need to fill the void and I decided mm -hmm. to do it, you know. So uh, it, it could have gone all the way up to a concern for their state income tax return or something of that sort, sure. you know, all the way down to PennDOT put some uh, ice and snow it's back on the sidewalk. Or, or <laughs> sidewalk. <laughs> Well, what types of uh, large-scale projects or special projects for the city were you involved with during your time? Well, a major project in the city that I was involved in was the need to keep state government in the city. Uh, there was a movement uh, back uh, in the 80s. Uh, I think Governor Thornburg, well, Governor Thornburg was the governor, and, and we had basically an executive uh, agreement that uh, through various governors that state government would be located uh, south of uh, Foster Street mm -hmm. and north of Chestnut. So in this quadrant here that we have basically the capital complex because there was a movement probably 10 years prior to that to take a neighborhood of the city. It was Now it's called Fox Ridge and tear it down and expand uh, building up into that area and uh, obviously a loss of a neighborhood right. uh, loss of tax dollars which was extremely important for Harrisburg uh, uh, they couldn't afford to lose any more tax dollars there was this decree if you will that came down from the governor's office and all the governors had honored it and uh, Governor Thornburg wanted to move at which which said 
basically that all state government would be in that area. He wanted to move the Department of, at that time, the Department of Environmental Resources over across the river and into an empty building there off Erford Road. Uh, it was it was formerly housed, I think, Capitol Blue Cross at the time. Uh, when you f come off that exit, it was sitting there. It's called the Senate Building today or something like that. And uh, he wanted to move DER over to that building. And uh, obviously, I moved, moved ahead regarding the fact that we had an executive decision regarding this and uh, no buildings would be outside of that. So there was a movement by um, people that supported that to, to break that uh, knowledge of, of, of locating there and to establish, if you will, the department across the river. Well, we had uh, Strawberry Square here, which was a commercial area. Uh, businesses were in those buildings. Uh, <clears throat> and we needed to keep, if you will, 15 to 1,700 jobs as a buying, a buying capacity sure. downtown for those buildings, to, uh, for those businesses to thrive. Uh, and, and to have a chance to succeed. Uh, you couldn't take population away from them because a lot of times they relied on that business just over the lunch hour right. uh, for those people to come. Absolutely. So we formulated a, a local group and I have to say that myself and Senator Shoemaker and Senator Hopper, who was from Cumberland County, uh, but John Shoemaker and I were the, were the main movers to maintain the DER building downtown and I had local support also from Rudy Danini and Joe Mann Miller and, and uh, Jeff Bacola uh, also to, uh, to keep it here in Harrisburg as well. Um, it was a heck of a fight. Uh, it was a big fight. Um, going against the governor wasn't easy. Uh, I had talked to members of the opposite party, the Republican Party, to see who can help me out. Uh, I, I lost a few members of the Democratic Party on the vote because uh, uh, of, of various things that occur during a vote and how you lose vote and gain votes and whatever. But, but I was proud to say that uh, 34 Republicans um, supported the effort to knock back uh, moving anything out of the city. Those jobs stayed here in the city to support the local business group. Uh, and they were very happy. And, and the construction uh, stayed in the city of Harrisburg as well. So <clears throat> it was important to maintain all of that. And, and that's, I never considered, and there are members that think this way, and unfortunately I don't like the way the legislator, legislator, legislative process operates today. There's too much of a partisan approach to legislation today. This was an issue. And issues don't have Republican and Democratic, uh, you know, you know, um, um, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, but uh, strengths where because I'm a Democrat, I'm going to vote for this because I'm right. a Republican. Yeah. There's very few issues are there that way, particularly an issue on relocating a Department of Government. And <clears throat> what it really did over the years, what I always cultivated was in my mind, I knew that it took 102 votes in the House to get something out of the House. It didn't take 102 Democratic votes. Sometimes there weren't 102 Democratic votes. And the same way on the other side of the aisle, it didn't take 102 two Republican votes. Uh, it took 102 votes of the 203 major, uh, members of the House. Mm -hmm. And it took, <coughs> excuse me, the 26 votes in the Senate. Uh, and if you had those numbers, then it took one more vote to have the legislation signed. That was the governor. So mm -hmm. in my mind constantly was the fact that 102 votes, you needed to get something out of this body and put it over in the Senate. And, and uh, it was important to work the numbers, not to work the parties. And as a result, like I said, I was proud to have 34 Republican votes because they came over because they supported me. Mm -hmm. And when you feel that and you know that your work over the years, when you supported them on something, get a bill out of a committee that the Democrats, Democrats controlled the majority of, I can go and talk to a chairman for a member that he wasn't moving the bill right. because of certain things or whatever, but when you talk to them, he was agreeable to move the bill. Well, that works out that you can hopefully in the future count on a vote for something you needed from, for yourself from this member. And that's the way the political process works. It's, a, it's, an, it's the art of compromise is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a dictatorship or anything else. It's, you compromise on issues, you bring something forward, you get an amendatory process that comes onto the table, you may not have what you initially 
introduced, but obviously what you have at the end is the compromise that came together as a result. And as a result of that comes the votes you needed to pass it. And that's the way my approach was constantly when it, when it came to legislation. And, uh, and a lot of times uh, I didn't have pride of authorship. In other right. words, if I saw something that I could amend that came over from the Senate mm -hmm. uh, that was germane to what I wanted to get passed, I would tack on an amendment to the Senate bill. Mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't have my name on it as the prime sponsor because it was a Senate bill I was amending, but the bottom line was that got to the governor for signature and we were able to effectuate uh, you know, legislation that way as well. I know you talked about uh, the importance of the tax base, the importance of having all these institutions downtown. Uh, it's certainly no secret that the city is going through some dire financial situation currently. Uh, still being active in this city, I want to know what your thoughts are about that and how, uh, maybe what types of things I can do to get out of it. Well, <clears throat> I think there's a, excuse me one second. <clears throat> I think there's an absolute need to consider Harrisburg as a special consideration in the legislature. Government should have a more reactive, positive influence in, uh, the Harris in Harrisburg because it is the capital city. Back in my days, the numbers we used to throw around was 48% of the property owners paid 100% of the property tax. Now that's a lot of unpaid, or excuse me, tax-free property. Most of it is state government property. You have churches and obviously that kind of thing. Uh, you, you have also the, uh, <coughs> the uh, non-profit um, organizations that have property in the city that don't pay property taxes as well. But there has to be a better approach and better balance in regarding this really incredible uh, unbalanced approach to who pays the property tax in the city of Harrisburg. I believe, and we started a process, believe it or not, 20 some years ago, that uh, Tom Calderon, who's still a member of the House, and myself, uh, he was from third class city Reading. Mm -hmm. He was the chairman of the third class city subcommittee under urban affairs. And we put together a package along with Gaynor Cawley, uh, who represented Scranton, uh, um, Kevin Blom, who represented Wilkes-Barre, uh, Terry Van Horn represented Washington County. We put together this package of bills that would start to uh, begin a process of including nonprofits and, and church buildings that weren't for just worship. We, we decided to exclude the, the house of worship, but the rectories and, mm -hmm. and the parsonages and the schools and those kinds of things. Um, and state government, and it was a quarter of 1% of what the property tax would have been that they would pay. One wow. quarter of 1%. And of course, <laughs> everybody said, well, uh, when you open it up this much, eventually you're going to have that much. Well, that may be true from the standpoint, I never thought it would open that wide, but I mean, just to say that we're taking part in, in assisting this municipality, no matter, no matter where it was, to thrive and, and obviously to be able to, to provide for their citizenry by this simple little tax that we would put in place to say that I'm taking part in this process as well. Um, we, we had public hearings on it and everything else. We couldn't move it for a vote on the floor. Hmm. But that kind of an approach, I think today, still is still a good one to start out with. There has to be Besides that, which would help all the municipalities across the street, then there has to be a speciality for Harrisburg. And there is an in lieu of tax program that is done in a few states that the capital city exists. I know Hartford, Connecticut, for one. Uh, uh, they get a special payment back as the capital city from state government to assist them in the things that they provide. You know, <clears throat> for instance, Harrisburg has a fire department. State government doesn't have a fire department. If there was a fire in this building today, the city of Harrisburg would respond to it. And because of the buildings that are here, special equipment has to be provided by the city of Harrisburg to get up that high in order to, to help with the fire. We had a fire where the old PennDOT building used to be. Uh, uh, now the Keystone building is there in the past. And, uh, you know, it was the Harrisburg Fire Department, uh, the paid fire department, that responded 
to the need of, of that, which necessitates no need for the city, or the, excuse me, the state to provide for fire protection, other than uh, what they provided in a small grant to the city as a, almost a thank you gesture to provide that department, but it was only, I mean, I think when I came to government, uh, it was $100,000, and by the time I left, you know, 12 years later, I think I got it up to a quarter of a million. Well, you know, to provide that kind of a department would have been probably a $10 million bill, and then to sustain it would have been a few million more a year. Right. Uh, so, I mean, I think that uh, the, the, the speciality that Harrisburg affords the city, uh, through the city, I mean, to the state, I mean, we provide police protection for the employees to come to work. We, we, we provide a highway department to take care of the street problems that may, there may be. There's the lighting at nighttime that, that exists. It's all paid by the citizens of Harrisburg, that 48% of the 100% mm -hmm. property owners that are paying the bill. And I think that speciality has to come down because of the sheer volume of land that the, that the state controls in the, in the city limits of Harrisburg. There must be some kind of viability to a plan that would come and accrue to Harrisburg uh, to have that special consideration. Well, let's transition to talk about your legislative career. Okay. You came into the Capitol, you're first swearing in. You've been in the, 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 the Capitol for years um, you know, as a page or, uh, and whatnot. But how about coming in for the first time swearing in? What, types of <coughs> feeling, what type of feeling was that? I still remember if, uh, if it happened yesterday. I mean, it was, it was that kind of a, a thing that it carries with you for the rest of your life. I mean, to, to take that fourth grade dream and, and for it to become real, and to stand there with your hand on the Bible, with your two children standing with you, you know, and, uh, and you're raising your hand to take the oath of office uh, as a member of the House of Representatives was, when I say, as I said, uh, it's a culmination of a dream, it certainly was. Um, a lot of effort went into that campaign. It was a grassroots campaign from my neighborhood. I was called the mayor of Bow Street. I mean, <laughs> I one little touch on. I'm glad one, you <laughs> one little block of of, the, of, uh, of Bow Street. The first hundred block of Bow Street was my my uh, launching pad, if you will, mm -hmm. and everybody on that street helped lick envelopes and uh, put things together. Uh, you know. I had, I had a person that didn't know what they were doing in the primary because we ran against the endorsed candidate uh, for that open seat, open seat okay? Yeah. And um, so uh, we rustled some feathers, I guess, but uh, let me tell you, we had a, a great little group. And, and then to be sworn in and to see them all there cheering and happy back in my office after we, we got sworn in and I went back to the office to. Uh, to receive their thanks and uh, to give their thanks, actually, and uh, and uh, they were just delighted and happy that uh, the day came uh, to to stand there and and uh, and uh, lift your hand up and, uh, and uh, it agree to support and defend the Constitution of the United States and of the state of Pennsylvania. I mean, so help you God. They're strong words, and uh, and if you're going to do the job right, uh, you know you have to. Make sure that you know what's going on in your district. So, and like I said, uh, it's important to keep the pulse of the people in your heart and in your mind. And so, when you're voting, you're not selfish in voting for yourself. You're voting for them. And I'm assuming it didn't get any less special. Pardon me. I'm assuming it didn't get any less special for six it, successive it, terms. It didn't. It didn't. Because each and every time, it was great. And then the grandeur of the day. I mean, as you know, there. You're, there are people, particularly uh, people that are elected the first time, get flower arrangements sends from their, mm -hmm. sent from their people and their constituencies and stuff like that. And it's a beautiful, auspicious occasion, if you will, to, to view. And, um, and, it, and it's just, if you're really taking the word of that oath to heart, it, it, each and every time you take it, it's like a lightning bolt going through your heart. I mean, you know how important representative democracy is because it replaced pure democracy. It replaced the town meetings where everybody right. came together. You know, you can't have a building where 12 million or 13 million people <laughs> in Pennsylvania are coming together for every single vote, and that's why it's important that the people get it right by electing the representative they want, but it's also important that the representative gets it right and represents them. Um, you knew uh, probably a little bit of the process, maybe a lot of the process coming in. 
um, but I'm sure you had people who mentored you early on. What were some of the people who mentored you? And what did they teach you? Well, I'll tell you. I had one phenomenal mentor, and he's still alive today. He's in his, he's in his early 90s. His name was Herbert Feynman. Herbert Feynman. Herb Feynman was the Speaker of the House. And one of those jobs I moved up to in grade school, I mean, excuse me, in high school and in the college, uh, starting out as a page boy, I ended up as the floor assistant to the speaker. I stood next to the speaker's rostrum uh, while Herb Feynman was the speaker. And Herb, just really listening to his advice for members that were coming up to the dais and talking to him regarding mm -hmm. things. and and learning different things. I still remember when I was elected, uh, then uh, uh, the leader was Jim Mandarino. And Jim Mandarino said to me, he said, look, I want you to promise me one thing. You have 28 new members in your class, both Republican and Democrat. Don't teach them everything you know on the first day. <laughs> promise me that. Let them find the bathrooms. That's the old common uh, lingo, you know. Yeah. Let them find where the bathrooms are. Don't, you don't have to show them. Um, let me tell you, working along Herb Feynman, I will say this, Herb Feynman was my mentor. Herb Feynman is a person I still respect today as one of the most wonderful people. He's considered the father of the modern legislature. Absolutely true. Uh, mm -hmm. Creating the committee system as we have it today, the permanent staffings that we have today in regards to, we used to train people and two years later when the Democrats or Republicans won or lost the House because it would switch back and forth that often, you know, the people that were trained and all of that and the money you had invested in them to teach them these positions were gone. They could be out of a job, right? Because 70 percent of the jobs were controlled by the majority party. And as a result, you could have 70 to job, percent of the jobs versus the 30, but if you lost the next election, it went this way. So you lost these people in between. Huge turnovers. And, and the turnovers were unbelievable. And um, after each uh, session, you would submit your resignation automatically, and then the the leadership would get together and they would go over all of the resignations that came in, and obviously 100% of them did, because then and they would pick and choose which ones they wanted to keep and who were important. Um, I was fortunate enough to survive a lot of those transitions. Um, uh, and, and I think it was basically because of the knowledge I had uh, not only of the process, but of the historical knowledge I had of the House of Representatives uh, in particular. And, and it was because of, of Herb Feynman taking me under his wing and, and just explaining things. I think Herb knew all along that one day I would probably be a member of the House, you know. And uh, uh, amazingly, uh, uh, I, I, I'm planning to give him a call soon and go down again and have lunch with him. Uh, it's something that I, I like to do. If he would, uh, if he would dye his hair black again, because he has pure white hair, <laughs> he would look the same. His mental capacities are the same, and it's just, just wonderful. Just, uh, he's a treat in my life that uh, I need to uh, talk to every once in a while. Uh, I mean, you served also with a number of other large personalities: Jim Mandarino, Speakers Irvis, Bob O'Donnell, Bill DeWeese. What was it like working for those type of men, seeing them in their in their leadership element? Uh, leadership wise, I mean, uh, if, if I would put if I would put a, a a pecking order on it, I would say Herb Feynman was number one because of the influence he had on me regarding learning the process. Herb used to say, you know, there's a hundred ways to pass legislation, there's a thousand ways to kill it, mm -hmm. and it's just as important to know how to kill it than it is to pass it because sometimes you'd have to kill it, you know. It was something you didn't want and, you, and the people of Pennsylvania didn't need, so to speak. So, um, and believe me, that's where I got my, my adage of not having pride of authorship. As long as the legislation got passed and put on the governor's desk, did it really matter that I was the prime sponsor of the bill or I found an avenue to get that legislation to the governor's desk? So Herb was number one. Jim Mandarino and I became just the best of friends. Um, uh, amazingly, he helped me through some personal crisis in my life back in those days, uh, that he was a tremendous influence on me from that standpoint, that he had a compassion and a heart that a lot of people didn't see. Uh, he was wonderful in that regards. Uh, he also was a, a good, firm leader. Uh, he, uh, he knew that he was never going to go to the floor of the House without the votes. 
and it, but it was important for him to have the votes, mm -hmm. and he knew how to count. And I don't think there was ever a time when Jim Manorino called for a vote that he didn't have the number of votes necessary to pass the legislation, even, you know, using Republican and Democratic votes. I'm not saying strictly his own party votes, but he knew uh, the proper way uh, to ask. He knew how far he can push you for your vote uh, because there was a lot of people in districts that, uh, and mine was considered initially as a district like this, that it could have gone either way in the future. But there were others that were uh, further into the hinterlands, if you will, that were Democrats that would use that, hey, but Jim, if I vote for this, and Jim would always say, he said, I would never ask you for your vote if I f thought it would mean your election. And he was right. I mean, he knew. I went, on, I went to him on behalf of some members that were saying, I can't do this. And that's, he even gave me that response. He says, Pete, you go back to them and you tell them. I would never, and you know, eventually he would get their votes because they trusted him. That factor, the trust factor in leadership, is so important. Uh, you found it again with, uh, with Bob O'Donnell as well. Bob was uh, more of a, um, a technocrat when it came to, uh, to the speakership, you know. But I'll tell you, he, he was a remarkable, for a young speaker, he was a remarkable uh, man to be speaker at the time when, uh, when Jim died. He was the right man for the job. And, uh, and, and the leaders since, I have to say, I, I did respect them. Um, there, there is uh, Bill DeWeese, who was a, a wonderful leader. Um, he had a, a, a good assistant in Mike Vion, and we both know today they're, they're serving time for um, uh, you know, situations that came up uh, with regards to uh, uh, working on state time and, and, and that kind of thing, but, um, but Mike Vion was one of those people that uh, had Bill's back and uh, you could go and talk to as far as uh, what, it, what it meant to uh, get something done and get something passed. Now, in and, and that interim time, I also then left the House and became, uh, came back in as the Bipartisan Management mm -hmm. Committee Executive Director, so I worked with all of the leaders after that, right. and it was because of my institutional knowledge that that happened. But uh, interesting enough, there are, there are things that occurred in my early legislative years uh, that uh, brought about some major pieces of legislation that I was involved in. And, uh, and uh, I don't know if you want to get into that, but... Uh, Absolutely. Okay, we can well. jump right into that. I mean, okay. I was going to ask you maybe an order of of importance for you, but I know uh, you've had some major bills passed, the whistleblower law, drug and alcohol issues, uh, medical insurance issues, so I'll let you uh, talk about whichever well, ones in whatever order. Well, we'll, st we'll start out with the, I, the one I think that was the most important was the drug and alcohol legislation, uh, drug and alcohol treatment. Mm -hmm. You know, up until the time that uh, in 1986 when our first alcohol component was passed for treatment, there was no treatment, if you will, for alcoholism in the mm -hmm. state of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And alcoholism in the mid-50s was declared by the AMA, American Medical Association, as a disease, okay? But it was one of those diseases, if you will, that was never covered under your, your insurances. So people would uh, trip off a curb, if you will, but they were alcoholic and break their arms. Well, they would go in and have their arm repaired, but they wouldn't have the root cause fixed. So it became a revolving door. You, you went in and got other things fixed, but that root cause was never accomplished as far as treating the root cause. And so in, I think my first term in 1981, I think it occurred, where Deb Beck from oh, the DASPOP, the Drug and Alcohol Service Providers of Pennsylvania, uh, came to see me. As a matter of fact, she didn't even form that organization yet. It, she was with a... ASI, Alcoholism Services Incorporated, which was a drug and alcohol service, uh, actually an alcoholism service, I guess, for uh, the public inebriant on the streets of Harrisburg, okay? And she came to me and explained that uh, there was this void between, you know, uh, fixing the root cause and not fixing the root cause and still spending health care dollars based on palpitations of the, you know, liver, you got the, the respiratory problems, you had heart oh, yeah. palpitations, you had all of, all of these problems coming on board, but nothing being fixed other than that disease that was recognized by that health care provider, but the alcoholism wasn't. 
And uh, so she gave me a lesson. And unfortunately, and I'll say this, unfortunately I jumped in with two feet and didn't even put my big toe on the land. I was in lock, stock, and barrel on the issue. It took five years for that alcoholism component mm -hmm. to pass. And I remember the first time I tried to amend a bill on the floor of the House, I got three or four votes on an issue to have alcoholism covered as a treatment. We knew we had to educate. That was the response to that vote. We knew we had to educate the members of the House and the Senate. And we took those years to do that. And then we got, in 1986, we got alcoholism covered, but we had a three-year sunset provision attached to that bill, which meant in three years the bill would go away unless it was renewed by the legislature. That's the only way I could get it accepted. Mm -hmm. If we had a time frame to it that it would die if it wasn't renewed. In other words, revisiting the bill in right. three years. So three years later we revisited it and not only did alcoholism prove cost effective to treat, we also added the component of drugs right. to that. So then we have drug and alcohol in 1989 and then the sunset provision was eliminated. So we didn't have to go back to the legislature to renew that. Well, obviously, Thousands of people have been helped by drug and alcohol treatment in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. which the bill itself made it mandatory that your health care provider, your third party provider, would provide that matrix for alcohol and drug treatment. Before this, it wasn't provided at all. So as a result of that, we had statistics that, uh, that really made it cost effective to treat, mm -hmm. even to the health care community. Although I have to say that uh, after I left the legislature and subsequently retired, there were problems involved with HMOs respecting that right. law. Yep. And as a result, uh, you know, they were sued. We went all the way to the Supreme Court and won. Just fairly recently. Yeah. Just yes. 2009. Just, that's correct. Sorry. It was yeah. only a couple of years back that it, that it occurred. So. Uh, so hopefully that will stay in place, although there's a parity bill that's going through Congress now that would hurt Act 106, as it was called in 1989, that would supersede Act 106, which Act 106 is considered the strongest bill in the country regarding alcohol and drug treatment. And it's because in those days we got word from California to say, hey, these, there's these groups called HMOs that are coming in. You better make your legislation tight. And if you don't, they can drive a Mack truck through a crack. And as a result, we did. And, um, and I have to say that uh, it's an amazing, amazing thing when someone comes up to you and says, are you former Representative Wambach? I said, yes, I am. But call me Pete. I always didn't like the formality of the, of the, of, of the title, if you will, because uh, it was the People's House that I belonged to. It was the House of Representatives, the House of Commons. It wasn't the House of Lords, the House of Senate, and we go back and forth on that all the time with senators, but it was the House of Commons. So I was always trying to refer myself just as Pete, and, and they would say to me, you saved my life. I still get goosebumps when I hear that. Mm -hmm. You saved my life. You know, there isn't a lot of legislation that you can pass that someone can eventually come up to you and say that to. You saved my life in minute, okay? I had a young man, well, I thought he was an old man. He knocked on my door for a sandwich one day, okay? I'm hungry, can you help me out? And I knew what he meant. He wanted a dollar bill so he can go and buy a, a bottle of beer or something at the corner, mm -hmm. corner bar. I said, well, just wait there for a minute. I'll, I'll go in and make you a sandwich. I made him a sandwich, came back out, sat on the porch with him, and he starts to cry. He says, you know, that was very kind for you to do. And he said, you know what I really wanted. I said, yeah, I did. I said, but why don't you help yourself and why don't you go for treatment? He says, I, I don't know, I'm scared. I said, what if I take that scare factor away? Could you, could you do that? I said, what's your name? He says, my name is Jimmy Stewart. He says, and I'm not the actor in a very drunken voice, okay? I said, well, I kind of <laughs> I kind of realize that, Jimmy, that's not you, you know, but, but I ended up begging these treatment program for a 90-day treatment for him, and they gave it to him. He sends me a Christmas card every year. Wow. Because that first year in the summer, he was playing badminton and volleyball with his children. I thought he was in his 60s or 70s. 
he was only like 41 or 42 wow. when, he, when he was on my porch. But that's Jimmy Stewart. They're the people that you can help, and they're the people that you can feel it really deep into your soul that you saved my life. Mm. This guy is productive today uh, because it works, and that was that. Well, I mean, because of this legislation, you were even called to Washington, D.C. to testify on yeah. pieces of, of legislation in Congress. That's right. Well, actually, it was the, it was the President's Commission on Drug and Alcohol right. Laws for the, for, the, for the country. And it turned out that uh, out of the eight or nine different provisions they provided for the other states to follow, five or six of them had their basis in Pennsylvania law right, because of the, of the laws yeah. that we passed here in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So that started under George Herbert Walker Bush and then continued under Bill Clinton. Uh, so uh, yeah, I testified down there twice uh, to the President's Commission on, on Drug and Alcohol Laws. This is after I left the legislature. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a thrill. Uh, also, you know, when you talk about the federal government, uh, one of my uh, second pieces of legislation, if you will, really evolved around the whistleblower law in Pennsylvania. And the whistleblower law was such that uh, it protects those who blow the whistle on wrongdoing in state and local government. That's what the act was all about. It emanated from a report that I did in college at Penn State Harrisburg that it, it basically uh, a young man working for the Department of Defense, Emmett Fitzgerald, uh, blew the whistle on the cost overruns for the C-5A military transport down out of Lockheed, Georgia. Uh, Lockheed in Marietta, Georgia is where it was. And obviously the strength that the uh, aerosystems industry had in Congress was such that uh, this guy, when he testified, he lost his job. And uh, he ended up getting his job back, I think, in like 68 or 69. Uh, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't an easy process because just by him testifying, he was fired on the spot. Uh, and yet he brought that wrongdoing to Congress, and Congress was supportive of him getting his job back, et cetera. The Pentagon wasn't. Right. As it turned out, however, you know, he worked out a, a situation where he got his job back and at the same level. As a matter of fact, I think he had to sue a little longer to get it back at the level that he was at. Uh, because the federal law was passed to protect him. Now, I was in college at the time when I wrote that report, and I, and I said to myself, if it was, boy, if there's any time I can effectuate something like that on the state level, I think I would do that. And after I was elected, I got, I got a little note from that professor. His name was Tom Knight from Penn State, Harrisburg. It said, now that you remember the House, what about the whistleblower law? And I took him up on it. And we passed the whistleblower law. And, and to this day, you know, I've had calls uh, uh, regarding the interpretation of the law and things like that that attorneys have called me about regarding protecting their clients and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, I told them they were on the right track because it does protect them for, for coming out and blowing the whistle. Uh, recently, it helped, I'm sure, Mike McCurdy uh, uh, from Penn State. Mm -hmm. It helped. Uh, uh, the uh, the people at uh, at uh, the Turnpike Commission right. who just uh, mm -hmm. was just announced uh, not too long ago right. regarding them, uh, you know, uh, and and so it's a good law and it does protect those. It gives an extra uh, eyes and ears to the arsenal uh, to each individual who works for government, both state and local, to be feel very confident regarding bringing forward a wrongdoing. Uh, so you're not recriminated against uh, by your supervisor or whatever, that you do have that protection. Uh, that was an incredibly important uh, piece of legislation as well. Um, the other piece I wanted to add to the drug and alcohol piece was uh, we had a situation where those who had third-party provider health care, you know, the Blue Cross Blue Shields, the Travelers and all of that, uh, that was fine. But the people who didn't have it, we wanted protected as well. So we ended up passing Act 152, which provided Medicare recipients uh, the opportunity to be served by drug and alcohol treatment as well. So that's in the matrix now for Medicare, uh, Medicaid recipients uh, through the state program uh, that they're provided that same opportunity. I think it's important to, 
not to have a government of haves and haves not from the people's point of view. So we had the haves that had insurance, the haves that didn't, ha the, the have nots that didn't have insurance, but they all still share in the treatment provisions of, of the laws that Pennsylvania passed. And that's a result of my, my work and a lot of other people's work in the, in, in the, in the, in the foxholes, if you will, that, uh, that helped. Because it was a battle. It wasn't, it wasn't an easy thing to do. I, I got great cooperation in the, in the uh, from Mary Ann Artie, who was a colleague from Delaware County, a Republican, who helped garner votes on the Republican side of the aisle. To this day, D. G. Uralamo, who is doing a fantastic job in creation of the Drug and Alcohol Department here in the Corbett administration, and and continues to fight for folks uh, that need drug and alcohol. Gene had his own son that was a, a drug addict. I had a brother who was. Uh, um, and it's uh, it, it's easy then to stay up and fight uh, through the debates hour after hour when you know that you know people that you're fighting for, and uh, it's it's an important part of, of of the attachment, if you will, to to legislation. You mentioned a lot of the key components into getting legislation passed. You got to have consensus. Um, the executive branch plays into it. You have to have compromise. And uh, there's a sense now that a lot of that has changed. You mentioned partisan politics early on when we talked about legislation and how it seems more so, that it's more politicized, more, more in that way. I, I know in the past, especially when you were involved, uh, members would get together off the floor many times throughout session. Why do you think that has changed? And do you see that as a good thing or a bad thing? Well. <clears throat> I remember in the early days when I was a page boy and watching the budgetary process start, if you will, and um, uh, in those days, you know, you had the hearings like you have now. Uh, you had the budget, budget presented by the governor, the hearings of the Appropriations Committee, and then, the, and then the floor action. And the floor action back in the early days, I'm talking back in the 60s, uh, that involved, if you were able to get your amendment into the budget to help a situation in your district or in general to increase dollars for public assistance or something like that, you were almost guaranteed that that amendment would remain in the final bill that went to the governor for his signature because you were able to garner those votes among your colleagues to do that. Then came the process of uh, agreeing to the amendments by conference committee that were put in by six members of the House, or five, three members of the House, three members of the Senate, generally a member of leadership and appropriations committee and another member that would get together from both houses and formulate the budget based on what they had before them, not based on what was fought for on the House floor or anything else, and all of a sudden, the only thing the members had to vote for was the result of that conference committee report. Mm -hmm. That took, I feel, and going back historically now, because I remember even when I wasn't a member, you know, 20 years before I became a member, or 15 years anyhow, I saw how the process worked. Right. And then all the way up through today, it's almost an identical process that, uh, that had uh, began maybe in the mid-80s on a regular basis, where uh, the conference committee report was what, what was held up to, to for you to vote on. Very little input, if you will, and uh, and it was it was a, a tough process to to swallow because as a rank and file member, you virtually had no say in the process uh, other than what you were able to get. Like when I increased the fire protection for Harrisburg, I was able to negotiate that with the leaders, and they guaranteed me it would stay in the final version. But the leader was sitting at the desk at the conference committee. Right. Uh, so it was important, I think, today to maybe get back to that. I mean, it's a more involved process. It's a tougher process. It's not an easy process, but it's a true process. It's a process where if you were able uh, to do it and, and, and to enable your um, uh, thoughts to go into the budget, they would remain. And that's why, I mean, you were fighting for your district. Mm -hmm. You were fighting for an issue that, uh, that uh, canopied Pennsylvania, whatever it was. Uh, 
it was a more involved process. There's a more today of sitting around, I think, waiting for the final product to come out. Although they go through the machinations of offering amendments uh, in the budget process, but when the House does that and it goes to the Senate and the Senate does that and then the, it, the bill comes back and the House doesn't agree and the, House, and the Senate doesn't agree and a conference committee is established, there's where you lose it all. I think also uh, there's too much uh, partisanship that's going on. Now I'm retired, you know, and maybe I'm more at freedom to say these things today than, than, than I would say as a sitting member or whatever, but, sure. but I think it's important for the future. Of, of the legislative process and the future of the General Assembly of Pennsylvania to get away from issues that are fought based on, on your party affiliation. Um, issues don't have party affiliations to them. I mean, issues are such that you should be able to uh, study an issue and, and decide on how to vote on that issue based on what your constituency feels about the issue. Uh, unfortunately, there's not enough of that today. There's, there's more of, well, this is our party position on it, and this is the way we want to go, and, and you better be on board. Um, I think what happens is the people get left out of the process, and then the members forget the fact that who is the boss? And like I said at the beginning, the bosses are those 60,000 people that you represent. And, and then your position becomes primary rather than their position on that issue. And as a result, you know, you hear things today of, well, well when did you decide to do that? Well, uh, I, I feel that's the way we should go because of a uh, personal thing or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, well, wait a minute, what about those people over there? Those people you represent in a representative democracy. You can't forget them, you know. I think today, because of the partisanship that we have, the bipartisanship is gone. Uh, although I, I, I think the leadership is more inclusive today in opinion, it's more, it's less of a dictatorship and that's good and maybe that's what I'm seeing as well in that mix of is it all part partisanship or is it the fact that members have more of a say in what's coming up on, on issues to their leadership, okay? Because most of the things funnel through that leadership as far as a future and a position is concerned. So, uh, but I still think that there's, uh, there's room for improvement and, and to get back to better days. Um, some people would argue, well, not necessarily better days when in fact the process ran on for months. Well, the process could run on for months, but if it was a better process that all the voices were heard, mm -hmm. isn't that a more uh, or isn't that a better, a better bottom line, that voices were heard in this process rather than a handful of voices were heard? And I think it's better to have every voice that needs to be heard on an issue to be heard. Do you think the, partis the, partis the growth of partisanship then has come from either an increase in the exposure of media, um, being that you can say anything anytime, anywhere and get it out to those constituents, but then at the same time, uh, you're being influenced maybe by national media from the national party, which is so prevalent now. You have stations that talk tr strictly about policy or strictly about one party versus another party. Does I, that play in? Do you think yeah, that oh, I, played I, into I it? think it does, and, but I, th I think also, you know, uh, coupled with that is the 24-7 media. You know, it's the talking heads that get out of there. No, no matter, it, there's a reporting of the news and then there's an opinion on the reporting of the news and then there's an opinion on the opinion of the reporting of the mm -hmm. news. And it never stops. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I think, in a way, I think one of the beauties of 24-hour reporting came about with what happened at the Boston Massacre. Uh, massacre, listen to me, I'm going back in history as a history major. But the Boston Marathon. You know, and what happened, I think people were riveted to their TV sets until uh, there was a capture there and uh, unfortunately uh, deaths there, three deaths or four deaths now and, and all of that. But uh, the, the important thing, f I think it was a report. They were reporting on what was going on versus having an opinion of what is going on is where all these talking heads come in and, and influence, I think wrongly, mm -hmm. what's going on. There are members, you know, you talk about political correctiveness. I mean, I hate the term because I think it's important to be 
correct in your mind and for your constituency than to put a finger in the air to see which way the wind is blowing before I open my mouth. I think, uh, I think an, an open democracy gives me that opportunity to say what I want to say, you know, and, and to say it and let where the problems fall, fall on me because I said those things rather than test the wind before I say it and everything comes out that is so, so pasteurized and homogenized, if you will, that, that it's, it's purer than it should be because I really set it through the screening process until I sifted out the best things to say before uh, a TV camera or, or my constituent group or whatever. I think, I think government is best represented by people that, that have the feel of what representative democracy is about. And, and, and like I said, takes that feeling because of their involvement in the community to the floor of the house. There's where the complete circle lies. You know, being elected and, and finding out what's going on in the community and then coming back with those opinions and putting them right back onto the floor of the house mm -hmm. to, to have that kind of open representation. Uh, like I said, when I heard, uh, you gotta be kidding when someone said, we only see Pete Wong back at election time, I mean, it was a wonderful accolade uh, because I was in the community. And I think more and more people need to get in the community, considering today also the limited dollars that are involved in it and how billions are being cut out of education or are being put uh, from this side over to here. And then all of a sudden, what, what municipalities have expected over the years in school districts on funding has, is, is gone. And then the local governments are... Or have to hold the bag on on what's going on, and as a result, taxes are going up and everything else. And uh, I think there is a need for uh, a more open uh, government and a need to say, "Hey, look, we're all in this together. Let's all come forward and sit down at the table and discuss it." Similar to what we're doing with my career today, just discuss what's going on, and 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 finding out what the best approach is to go forward on. And uh, I think until that day happens, there will be a lot of uh, disrespect for the process. You see now the number, the approval numbers are down to um, you know, close to single digits yeah. on, on oh, the approval. Absolutely. I mean, it's uh, it's a shame uh, because it's a it's a system that I respect very much. I will never not respect the system of the what representative democracy is about and what what. Uh, what it is to to be an effective legislator, but I think until that tide comes back and shifts back into uh, the fact that we need to discuss issues fully, we need to have a a concentrated approach on on how we're going to attack this issue, mm -hmm. not a D or an R approach or uh, this is the way we're going to do it. I don't care what you say. Uh, we are we're in the majority now. I mean, you can't use that approach anymore. I mean, there are influences that are coming in within the parties as well, with the Tea Party approach and, right, and things right. of that sort. I mean, these are all outside influences that we didn't have before. And they do really affect what representative democracy is about. Uh, whether or not it's a majority consensus or not should be what's the majority consensus in my district, mm -hmm. not the majority consensus of this group or that group or this group or this group. The most important group is your constituency. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing the job for the constituency, then the respect for the process and what the General Assembly is, both House and Senate and the governor, will rise. Uh, and until you get to that point, I think it, it stays low, unfortunately. With the advent of 24-7 media, um, having email constant, um, you're able to go online and find anything you want to find. How do you think that ha would have uh, maybe change the way you would have, if say you were elected recently, how would that would have changed what you've done? People don't have to come see you eye to eye if they didn't want to. They could email 24-7. Um, they could reach you any number of ways. How do you think that would have changed the way you would have served your constituency? And well, do you think that's a good thing? Well, <clears throat> well, I always think it's a good thing when you have an open openness between you and your constituency. Uh, now, I have to admit, in 1992, when I left the legislative process as a, as a member, I left the assembly, 
uh, you know, computers were just coming into their own, so to speak, mm -hmm. this thing called email and all this kind of stuff and everything was just happening and whatever. Uh, you had a, a, an email account, I had people that knew how to do those things and I didn't at the time because I, I was more of a one-on-one -on -one right. communicator. Uh, but today, you can't get by without that knowledge. Uh, I think it's good. I think it's a great pulse. I think it's a, a wonderful pulse on, on what the people are thinking with you. Mm -hmm. If you read those emails and don't just leave it up to a staff person, I mean, if you get into the thick of things and, and, and still maintain the ability to get that pulse, no matter how you get it, I think it's, it's important. Uh, it would be, listen, I don't have much hair left, but I, I would be pulling my hair out because I'm, I'm, I'm that kind of person that would want to respond to everybody individually and stuff like that. And I know that, uh, uh, that you have to leave some of these things up to staff because it's, it's gotten so big and uh, voluminous, if you will, for that, because of that contact and that pathway to get to you, and that's fine. I think that's good. Uh, but it, it, it would be a heck of a change and an adjustment for me. Uh, but it's something that obviously I would have to have done. To, as things modernize for the better, you you got to jump on board. I mean, you you can't just say I'm not going to do that. Right, you sure. know? Uh, because the most important thing is the people of voice, and no matter how they get it to you, it's the important thing that you've heard it. I guess to the government's credit, with a lot of this, there has been a movement to open things up. Uh, we have the right to know law, where people can write in if they uh, to get information from the government. Uh, committee meetings are now open. Um, do you think uh, this, this sort of era of reform that we have, because of some of the legal issues that have occurred to former members, this has been a response to? Um, do you think this era of reform is good, and do you think it will last? And well, is there more to do? I obviously, I think reform is always good, uh, uh, as long as you're not being selfish in your approach to what the reform is about. As long as it's not taking, uh, making your party ad, 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 uh, to be advantaged by what the reform, reform is about, I think it's good. As long as you uh, approach it by the fact that you're improving the system uh, and you're, you're tightening up on some loose ends, if you will, to make the, the system more efficient or better, I think that kind of an approach is, is wonderful for reform. I think when uh, when it goes overboard is when you become self-serving with the with the reform, uh, but I think I think reform obviously for what has happened and what has occurred, uh, I think it's necessary, uh, and uh, but it still uh, is important to understand again who you're working for, and as long as you're working on that reform to improve the system, no matter where the cards lie, I think that's important. Um, uh, listen, I think our whole life has been one reformation, if you will, from our birth to our death. There's all of these changes that have to be made uh, throughout our lifetime. I don't think government is any different. It, it needs to change. It needs to move forward. Uh, the flexibility of our Constitution, both federal and state, are based on the ambiguities that keep it current. So you don't have three million amendments to the Constitution. We have a Constitution that flexes. And, uh, and so, you know, you have uh, amendments that needed to be changed to come forward, and they have, but it's not a, a whole host of them because of that uh, ability to, to have the ambiguities built in so people can then go to the courts and have those things interpreted. Uh, you know, the final uh, setter of law, if you will, you can, you can make the law, but it's the interpretation of those laws that count. And then applying the law is the is the third component of that and and so I think uh, I think in that regard I think we've uh, uh, we've done good one thing before we move on from your legislative cor career one thing we didn't touch on was your work through committees when the committees that you served on you served as subcommittee chair of third class cities um, uh, I know you're in consumer affairs liquor control which seems kind of obvious um, what type of uh, Diff what, how is it different working through the committee process before you even get to the floor? What type of uh, uh, experience is that? Because there's fights and battles going on in the committee before you even get legislation yeah. out, out into the floor. Well, I think, I think the committee process is such, and I've always respected the committee process. I, I even uh, occasionally on the floor you would hear, uh, let's refer the bill 
back to committee or or whatever and it was always that well if it was if it was being done to make a change in committee and bring it back out it's one thing usually it was sent back to committee to kill the bill and i always thought that anything that came out of committee should at least be voted on because there was at those times in those days twenty some members of, uh, of the house that were on that certain committee uh, really that's where the action and and that's where uh, the legislation is is really uh, uh, brought about you know the, the changes in the amendatory process and everything else that occurs in committee is so much deeper uh, because the committee is studying that bill a lot deeper than you are as a member of the House, on the floor of the House, if you're not a member of that committee, you're a generalist. Mm -hmm. And you do expect those debates on the floor of the House to give the education to you as a member on the floor of what occurred in committee and the reasons for changes to the bill and, and those kinds of things. Uh, and, but I think the process of digging into that bill and tearing it apart and coming out with the best product, uh, that's the beauty of the committee system. They, uh, I mean, I, I felt that I was an expert in those committees that I was on based on the fact that I may not have been, like insurance. Right. Um, when I was on the insurance committee, when I first went on there, I wondered why I was there. I wasn't an insurance agent. I didn't know anything about insurance other than the fact I paid a premium every time. I wondered why, because when you really needed it, they never really came forth and paid for that car repair as, <laughs> as you would like to have had it. I mean, that was my exposure. But getting in and understanding and, and getting into what the industry was about and all of that and, and the rules and regulations they had to follow based on what the insurance department put out there in regulation and everything else, that all came together on the committee level. Just like drug and alcohol came together really in the labor, uh, in the liquor control committee, you know, uh, the state government committee that I was a member of. And, um, a number of different other committees over the years because every year your committee mm -hmm. can change every two years right, uh, sure. but uh, the most important one I think I was on was the Appropriations Committee obviously sure. it controlled the purse strings of government mm -hmm. uh, by that appropriation process and what you learned in those hearings the appropriation hearings were amazing when you talked about the budget because uh, every department and every agency would come before the Appropriations Committee so you really got to know what their departments were about and the nitty-gritty aspect of different bureaus and all of that. You really studied state government on the Appropriations Committee. That was the broadest, uh, probably the most uh, educational committee, if you will, sure. to me as an individual member. Uh, I think I learned more about state government on the Appropriations Committee than probably all the other committees combined. I mean, it's uh, you, you get into a speciality, say, for instance, if you're on the Education Committee. Well, you'll learn about education. You know, if you get on state government committee, well, you learn about uh, this department or that department. Mm -hmm. But the, the the host of the entirety of what government is about all funnels through the appropriations committee. So I mean, it was uh, it was a good educational experience to be on that committee. And then there were others, uh, you know, that uh, ancillary committees that I was on. You know, the Chesapeake Bay Commission, right. for instance. Yep. When I when I was down working on the the three state. Uh, uh, unit that we had. We had uh, eight members from Pennsylvania, eight members from New, uh, from uh, Maryland, and eight m members from Virginia. Uh, one of the one wonderful assets that we have is the Chesapeake Bay, but 50 percent of that fresh water flow into the bay comes from Pennsylvania. So it was up to us to listen to those experts, for instance, on uh, that came before us, uh, you know, in a in a committee that's outside of your regular General Assembly committees mm -hmm. uh, that we were able to listen the effect that we had on for over fertilization of, of, of farmland and the runoff that would go into the sewer systems and everything else and run into the streams and all of that feeding this discharge into the water system going into the bay was poisoning the bay uh, as a result you know we we passed uh, different legislation here in Pennsylvania that helped and assisted to educate farmers, if you will, because they would, for instance, uh, they would um, put fertilizer on their ground the way their grandfathers did and their fathers did, Not knowing with no sense of what, uh, what, what over-fertilization was doing, you know, yeah. that kind of thing, crop rotation, different things that you could do and to reinvigorate the soil, if you will, by not just putting chemicals on it, if mm -hmm. you will. 
And uh, so, you know, we have a good, clean Chesapeake Bay today because of the tri-state cooperation that we had on, on a committee such as that. You know, it was, it was, it was great you know, to be on a, a committee outside of government like that. And I think it's uh, no secret the longer you're here, seniority takes a sort of precedence. And yeah. you were here probably long enough time that you could probably could start thinking about leadership post, committee chairmanship. Did you have any thoughts about that, running for a leadership post? Or well, what? actually, I did run for a leadership post. Um, it was only in my second term that I ran. <laughs> I, I ran for caucus administrator back, uh, back in those days. Um, and I ran because I, I felt that I was the local legislator. I, can, I was here 24-7. I could give something back to my caucus um, that, that would be beneficial. Um, but I also respected the seniority system as well. I didn't like it at the beginning. Obviously, right. when you're on the bottom of the totem pole, mm -hmm. it doesn't help when, you're, when, when that pole is pretty high. But um, uh, as it turned out, I, I always said the, the more terms I was elected to, the better I liked the seniority system because <laughs> it just increased <laughs> you up that pole. But, um, but I think uh, all in all, you know, uh, when I did run uh, for caucus administrator, I ended up being one of the last two candidates in a field of nine. So I was knocking off s more senior members than I because I had this approach that I talked to members individually. And hey, listen, I was one Democrat from Dolphin County. Uh, you know, Philadelphia County had 30 Democrats. Uh, mm -hmm. Allegheny County probably had 15 or 20 Democrats. Right. You know, they had a good block to start out with. I had to start gathering votes one on one on one, mm -hmm. pulling votes, trying to work out some voting. So to eliminate seven other members that were running for caucus administrator because the low guy was out on the round and to get to the final vote I thought I thought I did pretty good, good. Yeah. although I lost <laughs> you know but um, but also I think there was a respect for the fact that I was the local legislator and when the Democrats were in the majority and that was uh, basically uh, I guess my first term I was in the minority but the next eight eight uh, well, ten, the next 10 years, the next five terms, I was in the majority. So uh, that worked out uh, to my advantage. But I never forgot, if you will, the importance of the minority. And like I said, uh, sharing and helping minority members that I was close to to try to get something passed as well because of the future need to ask them for their assistance and help when I needed it. And like I said, it would pay off on, on legislation that I, that I uh, wanted passed and needed passed. Declaring that then you were not going to seek another term, you were certainly recognized for your service, uh, and got to serve as speaker, preside as speaker pro tem. What, what, what kind of view was that like standing before the chamber as well, standing in, I'll in, the, in the room? I'll tell you what happened. Um, during the abortion control debate, uh, it was a long, involved debate, and uh, amendments left and right and everything else. The speaker occasionally would take a break. This is before my final uh, um, a farewell speech, if you will, when I became Speaker Pro Tem, mm -hmm. you know. But every once in a while, Representative Mandarino, being the speaker, would call me up to, uh, as well as a couple other people that he mm -hmm. that he wanted to do it. And I still remember getting a call from my sister in California, because one of the national uh, media outlets picked up the fact that. Uh, Pennsylvania was on the precipice of passing an abortion control act and there I was banging the gavel calling the house to order and she calls me and says oh my god I, I can't believe that I missed so much of your career when did you become speaker of the house you know <laughs> and, uh, and it was it was kind of funny and uh, but that was my, my speaker pro tem and when I first became speaker pro tem under the under that uh, kindness of, of uh, speaker Mandarino I said at the time, and I forget the amount of years, but I used to stand next to the speaker's rostrum mm -hmm. as the floor assistant to Herb right. Feynman. And there's one step up to the speaker's rostrum till you're standing on the same level with the speaker. And I remember getting that gavel from, uh, from, from Jim Mandarino, and I said, you know, it took 15 years to take one step up mm -hmm. to be at this dais. And uh, <clears throat> so that, uh, that was a thrill for me. But uh, the speech that you give when you leave is a tough one. 
Uh, I left. I didn't want to leave necessarily. I had to leave. I mean, I, I was burned out, Ray. I, I had to say goodbye to an institution I love because I was giving 120% 24-7, 365 days a year. In 12 years that I served as a member of the House, sadly, and I look back retrospectively, but sadly, I never took a vacation. I was here every day because I felt the constituency elected me and I have to be on the job. I should have left for a two-week vacation or whatever just to rejuvenate my battery, okay. to come back, uh, but I, I never did. And I think that was probably part of the reason why I decided to leave. I just had no more to give. I, I was tired. I, uh, it, it was such that uh, I respected and loved the institution, but I felt that I wasn't giving as much to it as I should have. Although when I really take a hard look at it and criticize it for what it was, I was giving more than a lot of other people were. Sure. A tremendous amount of other people were giving a lot, of le lot less to the institution than I was. But it wasn't, if I couldn't live at this standard of what I was uh, giving to the institution and, and representing the people of the 103rd District, I didn't want to serve anymore. And yet it was a very, very difficult decision to, to walk away. Uh, it didn't last that long, that's you know. Because, <laughs> I say uh, it was not the last time you set foot in the Capitol. That's correct. <laughs> I, I ended up uh, going into uh, private industry. Um, with, I became senior vice president of Vartan Enterprises Incorporated. John Vartan was an entrepreneur in this area. We were friends from, uh, from being in the same neighborhood. He had a little row house down the street from my, my house, and we were friends long before he became a multimillionaire and long before I became a member of the House of Representatives. But he, uh, we always kept in touch with each other because he was a dear, dear friend. He's now deceased. And, uh, and uh, so when I announced my decision to leave, I, I didn't know, really know what I was going to do. And then he, he called me up and says, you know, I want you to come into my company. You know, I've always enjoyed our relationship, et cetera, and whatever. And the one nice thing I think his wife, Morale, said to me one time, that she knew the day that, that Vartan hired me, and but she also knew the day I left, because it was the happiest and the saddest day of his life, you know, and because uh, she saw it in his face. But I had an opportunity, because each and every day I was going out to work for Vartan Enterprises, I was driving away from Harrisburg out into the suburbs on the eastern side. Right. And to me, my whole life, the center, the center of activity in life was that capital and the capital city. And I just, it was foreign to me to drive away from the city. Every day it was a torture. I even said to John, I said, why don't we take the penthouse down at your new building? At least we'll stay in Harrisburg. He said, I don't want to get too close to, the, to, to yeah. the politicians down there. You know, I'd rather live out here and look at my mountains and all of that. But it was, it was difficult for me. So when I had an opportunity, Carolyn Smith at PPONS uh, uh, called me up one day and said that uh, one of her colleagues, Don Osterling, the O in PPONS, was thinking about retiring in, in a while, but wanted to have someone come in and run her governmental affairs office. Well, as you can expect, when I went into Vartan, when I had that opportunity, I went into Vartan, and I said, you know, John, I know I've only been here six months, but boy, that'll keep me downtown. Mm -hmm. Governmental affairs, I could be at the Capitol again and all of that. And, and he very nicely and sweetly said, Pete, that's where you belong. You know, so I, I did leave and come down. And then in the House, when you leave, or the Senate, I believe, you have a one-year restriction on, on lobbying right. in, yeah. that, in that chamber. So I was only with Bartan for six months, so when I went with PPONS, I couldn't lobby the House, I could only lobby the Senate. And I met with a number of our clients that we had, six or seven clients at the time, and I told them that whatever we start, we would start in the Senate, and then eventually move it over in the House once we got it passed. And one day I was over on the House side, and, um, and I was walking down, it's probably one of the first times it was over the year, maybe a year and a week later, I'm walking on the House side, and, and uh, the Speaker of the House was Bill DeWeese at the time, and, and, uh, and Ivan Itkin was the leader of the House, and uh, they both stopped me in the hall, and they said, uh, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm legal now, I'm allowed over here, you know? And, uh, and they said, no, what, what are you doing? And I told them, and, and they said, um, 
Well, we have a position we'd like you to consider. Because of your institutional knowledge and your historic knowledge of the House of Representatives, would you consider coming in as the bipartisan management director? And I thought about it, and this is the committee that manages bipartisanly, because I had a Republican counterpart, uh, the affairs of the House. And um, so I, I said, look, let me discuss this with my wife. Let me uh, discuss it within my own self. You know, and I did that, and and even though I took a heck of a cut to come back into government, I just felt, going back to what my dad says, sometimes you got to give back, mm -hmm. and it was time for me to come and give back again, and uh, because I have a 35 and a half year history in government, as you know, and only 12 of those was as a member of the House, so I was obviously a an employee of state government prior to becoming a member of the House, and I became an employee again of the House of Representatives. But I became um, the executive director of that bipartisan management committee, and I told the five members when I met with them that if I don't have a 5-0 vote, which meant that if I didn't have the three Democrats and the two Republicans, I wasn't coming in. And um, sure enough, I got a 5-0 vote, because I figured if you're truly bipartisan, this will come forward in your vote to bring me in here. And I have to say that all of the members that I served, uh, now that's the Speaker of the House, the two leaders, the majority and minority leader, the Democrat and Republican leader, and the, and the whips on both sides of the aisle, I, I had a wonderful relationship with, with all five of them, and they changed over the years. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I had their support uh, in everything that, I've, that I did. Uh, for the Bipartisan Management Committee. I spent 14 years there mm -hmm. before I did retire in, in uh, December of 06. And I, I basically retired because I went to the funeral of my sister in May of 06. And it was tough because my sister Pat was a school teacher in New Jersey for all of her adult life. She was going to retire January of 07 and never made it. And I came back from there and I figured I wanted to go to 40 years and I thought, you know what, I'll give them a six-month notice because it's a position they have to fill. And I said, um, 36 and a half is enough, or 35 and a half was enough. I, uh, I don't need to go to 40. Uh, and if I didn't get an omen from my sister's death, shame on me. So I left government. I, I still try to keep an ear. Uh, I'm one of those guys every once in a while would turn on PCN and watch the House debate on some issues. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I enjoy doing that. Uh, I, I enjoy coming into the Capitol and, uh, and seeing folks every once in a while when I'm coming in for a purpose. I spoke uh, at, uh, the other day, a student lobby day for community colleges. I was the wrap-up speaker as a member of a board of trustees at Harrisburg Area Community College. I speaking at the bully pulpit again, and, and, the, and the rotunda was just a joy for me. But I also enjoy driving home. You know, I mean, that was, that was good. Uh, but uh, I'll never forget, over all, all the time that I spent here, how much of an enjoyable time it was. Uh, I was involved in the renovation process of, uh, of the House side of the Capitol building for a number of years when I was on the Bipartisan Management Committee. And tearing out all of the drop ceilings and taking out the paneling and going back to the original right. uh, finishes on the walls and making this capital what it once was in its glory when it was built, uh, it got a reputation. I mean, the uh, the Smithsonian wrote an article on state capital buildings in the mid 50s or 60s and called Pennsylvania's capital the most beautiful in the United States. We took it back to there. Uh, we went back to the original finishes, bringing bringing in archivists and and um, uh, uh, you know, people that were involved in making sure that we had the original finishes on the walls and things of that sort, and making a, a 1906 building operate in the 21st century with uh, all of the modern equipment that mm -hmm. you needed and the wiring that you needed, the Cat 5 wiring and everything else, right. and imagine yeah. pulling that through walls that were ornate and plaster filled and and all of that. It wasn't like you were running it between two studs. I mean, it was a very difficult process. But I'm very proud of the fact that we accomplished that uh, when I was on the Bipartisan Man Management Committee. It was uh, a long and tedious process, but boy, when I walk in this, coming over to this studio today and, and seeing the, the, the way we connected the buildings up to come over here and making 
basement space looked like uh, nice office space because mm -hmm. uh, at one point when you were in the basement of the Capitol or you were on the fifth floor, which was an attic back in my earlier days when I first uh, stepped foot into the Capitol as a page boy. Uh, uh, now to have productive office space in both of those areas and have connective space uh, that's appropriate for what this building is about is an, was an important part of that phase of my career and, and to walk through it and see the, the beauty that, that was created as a result of cooperation between uh, the governor's office, the House of Representatives, uh, the Senate, and uh, uh, the judiciary and the governor's office, oh, I said the governor's office, I think, uh, it was important that we were all on the same page because we dislocated people temporarily while right. this space was done. Yeah. So we, we had to do it and retrofit it while it was an occupied building as well. So cooperation on all fronts was important and we, we accomplished that. So that, that was a nice, um, a nice project to work on and then something that I can still come back and look at and marvel at the fact that I can't believe we did this, but we did. <laughs> That's right. Um, you've had some years to reflect on your service. Um, what types of things, what types of lessons have you learned throughout this whole 35 and a half year career that you're still maybe using or you're passing on to students when you speak to them? Um, I, I think the biggest lesson you can, you, I can take away from all of it is, is it's, it's going back to the fact that you, no matter what you do, you also have to make sure that you left this place better than it was when you first came to it. Whether that's uh, your community, whether or not it's a building like the Capitol building, whether or not it's a process like the legislative process or whatever. I mean, I, I think it's also important that you've given back. You've taken from, but you've also given back more than you've taken out of. And I think, um, once you're able to say that you've accomplished that and had done that, I mean, that's why it's important for me to finally come down and do an interview with you for our archival purposes. And, and by the way, our, the archives division of the House of Representatives were created under the bipartisan management years, the, which uh, Susan Cohen and I were here. And uh, I think it's something that is, it's beautiful to preserve and, and something that I recently had my father's collection of books donated to the House archives and library. I think it's important that uh, uh, we understand, uh, you know, I mean, his contributions uh, to statewide, his love of Pennsylvania, his, it's a beautiful day in Pennsylvania program and, and all of that. And, and to know that these books that I had contributed were the books that he used. He didn't have an internet, right, you know. Sure. Uh, <laughs> he, he, these were the books that he used as the basis of his research and everything else. But to give it back to a a, a group of folks that you work for today in the archives with, with you and Heidi Mays and others that are still giving their time to that group is important. We need to preserve what has gone on in the past in order to improve ourselves in the future. And I think if we don't learn from the lessons of the past, we're doomed in the future. And, and I think the archives is, uh, is an area that does that. And I'm very proud of what our archives group has done here in the house. I, th I guess the opposite of that question would be, since you have time to reflect back, any regrets? Um, I don't have many regrets from the standpoint of accomplishment of things that I worked on. Obviously, you know, finding a solution for, for municipalities and third-class cities and, and second-class and even first-class cities in Philadelphia, uh, of, of funding that. and and having some kind of a better basis for that, having a speciality of Harrisburg like I spoke about before, being the capital city and should be recognized by the state uh, because of the, the vast uh, uh, acreage, prime acreage. You know, Obviously there are other communities that may have more acreage because they have state game lands. Well, mountain lands are a little different than top priority uh, uh, land in the middle of an urban center, you know. Uh, but I think, I think not Putting that on a, on a on a better footing, I have a regret uh, that that we couldn't accomplish. But the the days back then were different than they are today. I mean, um, the need to work on that, however, hasn't gone away. And I think if uh, current members of the House uh, from urban centers or from actually not necessarily just urban centers, but 
can uh, reinvigorate that approach and to maybe go back into archives and see what we tried to do with our five or six package bills that we had back in those days to try to try to put it on the front burner again I think would be be great and I think listening to the people um, uh, the fact is I, I I have a positive side of that because I being a political scientist and a, a, a civic-minded person I, I knew the importance of of listening to the people and, and uh, taking that forward. I had uh, someone recently said to a, a friend of mine, well, well, Pete had a temper, you know, and I kind of laughed about that. I said, you know, I said, it's different when you're talking about issues that you were involved in and felt very f fervent to get past and, uh, and uh, had that strength behind your voice not to have people who needed, for instance, drug and alcohol treatment to get it came across as some people as being having a temper but when I recently spoke in the rotunda and the person that told me that was in the rotunda he came up to me and said I see what you mean now you 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 have a fervent issue uh, on, on the issue of community colleges and it really came through strong mm -hmm. I, I see I see exactly what you explained to me a couple weeks ago so I mean, it was it was nice to mm -hmm. be able to uh, witness that, if you will, to to uh, to to show somebody what it meant to be so strong on an issue that you 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 really couldn't allow it to fall by the wayside. And I'll give you a quick example of that. Mm -hmm. We had a we had a bill in the Liquor Control Committee for drug and alcohol treatment, and the night before I was at a Gadenzia graduation, which at Gudenzia was a, a drug and alcohol provider, and it still is very prevalent in Pennsylvania, I think, in Maryland and Delaware, maybe even Virginia. I mean, it's a huge organization today, but back then it was primarily Pennsylvania. And I went to the local graduation where these, these literally, these kids got up and was thankful for the process of treatment and how their lives were back together. This was after their first year of sobriety. Mm -hmm. So they had some time of being on their own and everything else. And uh, literally, if you just listen to them with tears in your eyes. You were crying at their testimony. I mean, it was so strong and so purposeful. Uh, it, it was amazing to hear it. Well, the next day, I was before the committee, and I was speaking on behalf of this amendment that was supposed to, you know, what we thought we had the votes for. And my members who told me they were voting for it weren't coming. And here I found out there were other members discouraging them to come because they wanted to beat me in committee. So I stood there and I finally realized what was happening. So I figured the only way I could keep the members here and get people out bringing the members that I needed there was to stay and speak. So there I was speaking for probably 45 minutes to an hour on a three-word amendment or something that would have changed this bill. But 20 minutes into that, these kids started to come in that were at the graduation the night before. And you talk about getting strength from somebody. These kids came in and sat behind me, and I knew why I was fighting so hard. I was fighting so the next generation of kids like them would be there in the future so they can speak at a Cadenzia graduation. So when it was personalized like that, you know, speaking 45 minutes to an hour is pretty simple. When you know that you have lives that by your own words can be effectuated. And as a result, those straggling members did come in. We got the bill out of committee and we passed a bill on the floor that eventually became the act that we passed for alcohol in 1986. So that strength immediately was given back to me. I had no idea they were coming or anything else. Mike Harl, the president of Cadenzia today, uh, pulled them together and said, you know what, uh, Representative Wambach that was there for you last night, or tonight, you know, is speaking tomorrow. Why don't we all get together and go in and support him? And that's what happened. But it gave me the strength to uh, persevere and to, uh, uh, as I always say, put a period at the end of the sentence because they certainly uh, concluded 
uh, that day with a positive vote in committee because of the strength that they gave me. Speaking of the next generation then, what advice would you give to those maybe looking to seek office or looking to go into the field of political science or serving in public, public office? What would your advice be for them? Do it. Uh, it's that simple. Just mm -hmm. do it. Put in your time because everything good takes time. Um, there are people that come to me today and say, look, I want to serve. I said, what have you been doing? Oh, nothing. I just want to serve. I said, well, get involved in your community. You know, uh, go to a, a local meeting. Uh, get involved in groups, you know, environmental groups, whatever you want to do. Get involved. Get yourself and your reputation out there. Get to be known and everything else because, you know, you certainly can't run on, on no background. Right. You know, but you obviously can... In fact, you want to give, and that's important. I remember after Watergate, one of the questions that were asked was that identical question to one of the people that were involved in Watergate. And they said, I'd tell them to run as far away from politics as they can. I thought, what a disservice. We need people that are interested. We need people that the agenda is such that will come forward based on their background and knowledge and their their input into their community over the years to come forth and to bring that and then to bring the people they represent with them mm -hmm. to the floor of the house. It's the process that uh, is cyclical. You know, there are people that uh, have the idealism that I had going in. And you know, when I left, I still had it. I think that was important. I think maybe I would have lost a little bit of it, but I haven't and I won't. I will never discourage someone to get involved. I think it's great to be able to uh, give and uh, and and if you have a talent for representative democracy and you want to be involved and I don't care at what level mm -hmm. you know I think it's important that you do that I would absolutely openly encourage people to be involved it's the way to go over over the years you've been uh, recognized different awards for your service is there one that stands out to you and uh, do you think uh, uh, how do you perceive those type of awards as being part of your public service? Um, <clears throat> there's one that absolutely is above all the others. It's the uh, it's the award I got from Cadenzia. Uh, there were only three other times it was given out in the history of Cadenzia, in a, a time or two after I, Arlen Specter. Hmm was the first one recognized. I was the second one recognized. Um, but it's, a, it's an award that you get. It's a fallen down horse. It's a statue. And the, the story behind the name Gadenzia is that there was a town in Italy that this horse ran a race and it tripped and f fell and got up and even though riderless and lame finished the race and won. So it takes that whole thought of when in life, due to an addiction, you could fall. The important thing is that you got back up and you finished your race. So Gadenzia, that, that award was probably uh, the monumental award and obviously an area of work in the legislature that I spent the most time in as well. But receiving that award was uh, was just something. It's of all the awards that I received in the past, it's the only one I have in my living room, uh, still on display. You know, uh, there's a secondary award uh, that I got that uh, it calls to mind just because of your question. Was from the gay community of Harrisburg. Uh, they gave me a beautiful award, and. Um, I have that displayed at my house, but all the other ones are packed away. And that award was given to me because I wasn't afraid of, uh, of gay issues. Uh, I was probably one of the first ones that uh, spoke in support of, uh, of the gay community in Harrisburg, which is substantial. And, and it's a lot bigger than it was back in my days. But, but we had some, uh, some people in our caucus that were just as committed to the gay issues that I was. And, uh, and I think, uh, 
I think that award was almost an award that said uh, something like the Pete Wambach who's not afraid of his shadow. You know, willing to stand out uh, in public light, if you will, to support issues that were important to them. I don't like the terminology of third class citizen. Everybody's a first class citizen in my book. And, and even though there could be issues that I don't support, they still need to have the recognition. And not because of, um, amazingly, someone gave me this lesson a long time ago that said, why do you judge people as to what they are rather than who they are? And you can't get much more powerful than mm -hmm. that. So I stopped judging people of what they were, and I judge them now on who they are, what they're made out of. So I guess the Gadenzi Award is number one, and the, but the secondary award is from the local gay community. The Pete Wambach as a legislator never took a vacation. Now that uh, Pete Wambach is now retired from public service, how does he fill his time? Well. Uh, on the, for another office? No, 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 I don't think so. Um, of course, they always say never say never, and I guess even though I'm saying never, I'm not, I'm not saying never, I, I think I'm thinking never, but, uh, but uh, I, I love the fact that I'm, I'm supporting the community college uh, with, with my uh, board of trustees membership, if you will, and it's, uh, it's like I said, that, that institution means so much to me from the standpoint of of uh, starting my college education. Without it, I, I don't know where I would be. I probably, I, as I did get to get money to go back to school, I worked at Bethlehem Steel, I probably would have spent 30 years in the steel mill. Uh, without, uh, without the community college education, the desire to finish my education at Penn State Harrisburg. But uh, I, I, I do that. Uh, every morning, um, I'm at a McDonald's. Uh, with what we call the McGeezers. We, we're a bunch of geezers that, because we're at McDonald's, we're the McGeezers. And uh, we spend our morning solving every problem of the day, the day before, that we can uh, hear about or read about. And we solve them. Every day we solve every one. Uh, <laughs> and we solve crossword puzzles and crypto quotes and everything else sure. besides that. Um, but I think my primary uh, motivation today is, is obviously to be a good husband to my wife, who. Uh, is just a wonderful person. We're planning a trip to her native land, which is Poland, uh, in September. So I will get a little bit of vacation there. Sure. Um, uh, she's kind of funny because she, she wants to visit Hawaii and places like that, and I want to go to Europe and visit her homeland and her, her birthplace and everything else. And so she's, uh, she acquiesced to me on that. And, uh, <laughs> But she wants to go home, too, because she wants to see uh, former, former classmates and things like that. And her mother is still living. And she comes over and visits us, though. And, and, but she has a sister there and another sister in England who, when we're there, she wants to come to Poland to be with us. And, and so uh, I'm, I am taking the time to, uh, to smell the roses, if you will, although retirement has been nice to me. And, and I am smelling the roses every day as well, even though uh, I'm not leaving Harrisburg, uh, right. but that's going to be a major trip this year for us and uh, something I'm really looking forward to. I always still uh, get involved with kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's important uh, just today walking up through Capitol Park, um, four or five little uh, minority kids were in the park running around and stuff. This one little girl came up and grabbed my leg and held me and, and kind of squeezed. She must have been five years old or four years old or something like that. So I kind of stooped down and I talked to her and three or four other kids came over. And, and I, I mean, the future is the children. And, uh, and to see the smiles and just the, the love coming out of those four or five kids that were there, part of their school group mm -hmm. that, that surrounded me coming up. Matter of fact, I thought I was going to be late for your interview because I took about 10 minutes with them. But um, I think if you, you have to have the time to reflect with them. And uh, those, of, uh, those of us, and believe me, I'm guilty of this, who miss that opportunity with my own kids occasionally because of, of work, mm -hmm. uh, if, I, if I have something that I regret, it's probably personal. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's the family situation with my children. I would have loved to have spent more time with them. Uh, we have wonderful relationships today. I have two children. Uh, Heather is 
38 and Peter is 36 and and um, uh, they're wonderful kids and I'm pleased to have them but uh, there were times that I may have uh, should have would have should have uh, done things differently but uh, uh, I'm looking forward to helping my son uh, he's he's going to be settling on a house that he's buying in Harrisburg and I'm oh, wow. delighted he's coming back to uh, he's only in Mechanicsburg but mm -hmm. he misses that uh, urban center kind of environment where he can ride his bike to work and, and that kind of thing and and I'm so proud of him for coming back and my daughter doing so well in California she's in San Francisco and and working for an events coordinator out there and, um, and she loves every minute of it and and uh, but we all have our, our little reasons to touch base with us personally mm -hmm. uh, because of a problem that may come up or but we all have uh, we all three of us have uh, have an, an incredible uh, desire to keep each of us in the loop, which is important today, I think, as well. I guess then my last question would be, how would you like to be remembered? What would you like the history books to say about Pete Wambach? Uh, you know, when my friend John Vartan died, he had a little epitaph on his tombstone that I think was wonderful. and. Um, he did his best, and he did it in goodwill, was his quote. And it's on his tombstone today. And I, I think that if I want to be remembered, it would be remembered that I gave it my all, and uh, I did it in the goodwill of everyone. I'm reminded of that old uh, spiritual that I would hear in the black churches when I would go and visit them when I was a member of the house, and I still visit them today. But um, it's, if I can help someone as I travel on, then my living shall not be in vain. And it's a great spiritual build around those words. And uh, that's probably the best way I could feel that I wanted to be remembered. I think that's a great place to end. And I want to thank you again for sitting down with us today and, and, and reliving and reflecting on your career. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, and uh, I'm sorry it took so long for me to agree. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.